Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg. It happened. The Booker Prize announced its long list for 2023 and I am here today to react to that. Just a quick shout out because the jury for this year is chaired by Essie Adujan and I know a lot of people will be talking about her as the author of Washington Black. I am the guy out here on the internet who will be telling you to check out Half-Blood Blues instead because if you haven't this is a really fantastic book and I just wanted to mention that. I would also like to encourage you that if any of these books interest you, seek them out at an independent bookstore. Of course, I am wearing an independent bookstore t-shirt today. This is for Chapter One Books in Hamilton, which is not far from where I live in Missoula, and uh, just one of my local Montana stores. Of course, you know I also love Montana Book Company, and I would, I would just encourage you... If any of these books sound appealing to you, they might not all be available in the United States. I did not look to see if they are, uh, but reach out to your local independent and uh, get them that way. Let's quickly jump to the elephant in the room before we get to the actual long-listed books and talk about one of the big snubs on this list. What happened, Booker Jury? What happened? To be fair, I knew it was going to be extremely difficult for Demon Copperhead by Barbara King Solver to really make a case for itself in the run up to the Booker Prize announcement because at this point in time, Demon Copperhead has been recognized by like the New York Times as one of the 10 book best books of last year. It was recognized by the Pulitzer Prize where it co-won with trust. I was ecstatic. I have a whole reaction down below that you can check out if you have not already. It won the Women's Prize. So a lot has been happening for this book already. This is a book that was released last year, but after the cutoff for eligibility for the Booker Prize. So it does feel like it's been around forever at this point. It's one of those weird things about the qualifying period for the Booker. And it's just something that happens when you don't use the calendar year as the eligibility period you end up with these situations where it feels like this should have been in the running last year, but it's actually eligible for this year. I knew it wasn't going to win. I had a feeling that it wouldn't even make the shortlist. I knew that. I knew that. I just felt like I hoped, let's say I had hoped that it would make the long list for the Booker Prize. I don't want to ask for too much for Demon Copperhead, but it feels like including it on the long list would have at least been a way of saying, this is a really good book. We acknowledge that. Now let's move on and look at some other things. I, I feel like that would have been a sort of nice thing to do. It didn't happen. Part of me is even wondering if it would have made the long list, even if you took away the Pulitzer Prize, and the Women's Prize, because it definitely seems like the jury chaired by Essie Adujan is not looking for big names this year at all, because Robert Kingsolver didn't make the long list, Zadie Smith didn't make the long list, Salman Rushdie didn't make the long list, and that feels a little pointed at a certain point. You know, I, I, I know people don't like to think of juries for a major prize thinking about, say, politics or what has already won or anything like that. But it always comes into play because book awards, any award, not just book awards, are subjective. How you define what is the best is going to be very different from how someone else defines what is the best. And how you handle awarding a book prize could be very different from somebody else. In Michael Cunningham's essay about what happened in 2012 when he was part of the jury for the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction and the board decided not to announce a winner, is fascinating because in part he talked about how he thought about what to do with the responsibility of being on the jury and how to think about approaching it. Like, do you go for a book that is already known, already best-selling, an author who has already achieved a lot, or... Do you take that platform and try to give it to a lesser-known author or a lesser-known title? Do you try to draw attention of an audience to something specific? And it feels like the Booker jury this year didn't just throw out 
known names, but they definitely ignored the bigger names. Again, Zadie Smith, Barbara Kingsolver, Salman Rushdie. For all three of them to miss the list, it feels intentional. It, it feels like they were looking for smaller things. And what's interesting about this, jumping ahead to one of the people who did make the list, Paul Harding has won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction. Technically speaking, he should be in the same company as Barbara Kingsolver. However, he has kept an extremely low profile as an author since he won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction for Tinkers in uh, 2010 or 2011. And I think that means that even though he is an author who has achieved a lot, he still feels like a relatively unknown author worthy of being lifted up. We'll talk more about Paul Harding later on. And there are some big names on the list. They're just not immediately recognizable, like Barbara Kingsolver, Zadie Smith, Salman Rushdie. And I know a lot of people are going to be particularly upset about Salman Rushdie. I'm over here for <laughs> Demon Copperhead, but I know a lot of people were really hoping for Salman Rushdie. I think since the attack on him, a lot of people have wanted to see him sort of make a big awards comeback. There was a huge push for him, or a, a groundswell of people hoping that he would win the Nobel Prize for Literature last year. It did not happen. And I feel like, again, as we get closer to the Nobel Prize announcement, I think a lot of people are going to have a surging sense of goodwill and hope for Salman Rushdie. And I think that is probably going to be one of the things people will end up talking about the most, the fact that he did not end up making the list. Oh, well. It's a great book, The Steam and Copperhead, and it has achieved a lot. It is already a bestseller. Technically speaking, it doesn't need the Booker Prize. I knew it wasn't going to win. I just hoped that it would at least make the long list. And uh, it, again, I think the most significant thing about Demon Copperhead not making the long list is that it keeps company with other really big literary names like Zadie Smith and Salman Rushdie as an omission. And that, I think, indicates how the jury this year is approaching what they think the Booker Prize should do and how it should recognize titles. And then since we're already talking about snubs, let's just quickly talk about some other things from my wish list. So in my last Friday Reads video, I talked about a Booker wish list. I did not do predictions. My Booker wish list was that I hoped Demon Copperhead would make, at least make the long list. Obviously, it did not pan out. I included this other Eden by Paul Harding. That's the only one that made the list. So we say goodbye to Wandering Souls by Cecily Pinn. I actually am about to start this book on audio. I'm really looking forward to it. I've heard a lot of really good things. This was long listed for the Women's Prize, and a lot of people were devastated when it did not make the shortlist. This could have felt like a way of pointing people back toward it, but, you know, book prizes don't like to think of themselves as quirks, course corrections, I'm sure. So clearly they had other goals in mind, and Wandering Souls is uh, not making the cut again. I think one of the big surprises today is In Memoriam by Alice Wynn. I saw this book on pretty much every Booker Prize prediction video that was created. And that means that this, this feels like even more of a surprise than Demon Copperhead not making the list. Because Demon Copperhead had a lot of things going for it, but also things that made it difficult. Like It's been so recognized and saturated at this point. In Memoriam is from a pretty unknown author. It's had been a sort of word of mouth hit. It had a very quiet release earlier this year, and then people have just been talking about it and speculating about whether or not it would make the Booker Prize. So it feels surprising that it didn't make the list. And I know a lot of people were predicting that it would. So it's, uh, it's a surprise. It's definitely a surprise. And I still will hopefully read it at some point, but it will not be in contention for the Booker Prize. Now, I'm nine and a half minutes into this video, and we haven't talked about any of the finalists. So let's 
get started with that. Now, before we get into the actual discussion of the book, really quickly, let's just look at some facts about these finalists on the Booker website, which will be linked down below. Here are the bullets that they provide. There are 10 writers longlisted for the first time, including four debut novelists. There are three writers with seven previous nominations between them. I believe Sebastian Barry has a bunch of them. Uh, there are writers from seven countries across four continents. There are four Irish writers making up a third of the long list for the first time. There is a novel featuring a neurodiverse protagonist written from personal experience. And all 13 novels cast new light on what it means to exist in our time, and they do so in original and thrilling ways, according to Essie Adujan, Chair of the Judges. Let's jump in to the finalists. Shall we? There are, I mentioned in my wish list for the Booker Prize that I, I was limiting it to four in part because I really wanted some discoveries. And there are some books on this list that I really don't know anything about. So it'll be interesting to get to them. The first one is not one of those books. I've heard of it because it was on a lot of prediction videos for the Booker Prize. It's The House of Doors by Tan Tuan Eng. Long listed for the Booker Prize 2023, based on real events, Booker Prize shortlisted Tan Tuan Eng's masterful novel of public morality and private truth examines love and betrayal under the shadow of empire. It is 1921, and at Cassowary House in the Straits Settlements of Penang, Robert Hamlin is a well-to-do lawyer, his steely wife Leslie a society hostess. Their lives are invigorated when Willie, an old friend of Robert's, comes to stay. Willie Somerset Maugham is one of the greatest writers of his day, but he is beleaguered by an unhappy marriage, ill health, and business interests that have gone badly awry. He is also struggling to write. The more Leslie's friendship with Willie grows, the more clearly she sees him as he is, a man who has no choice but to mask his true self. As Willie prepares to face his demons, Leslie confides secrets of her own, including her connection to the case of an English woman charged with murder in the Kuala Lumpur courts, a tragedy down, drawn from fact and worthy of fiction. I've heard some slightly mixed things about this book. However, it feels like this is another book that was on all, if not most, prediction videos that I saw. So it's not surprising at all that it is on the list. I don't know that I'm that excited to read it. This feels like something that has a lot of momentum to make it to the shortlist. And I think I'm going to wait and see what people start saying now that the long list has been announced and see how that discourse goes. And if it makes the shortlist, I might be convinced to sort of prioritize it. But I've heard enough mixed things that I'm a little wary. Here's a little bit about Tan Tuan Eng. Born in Penang, Malaysia, and worked as an advocate in one of Kuala Lumpur's leading law firms before becoming a full-time writer. His debut novel, The Gift of Rain, was longlisted for the Booker Prize in 2007 and has been widely translated. The Garden of Evening Mists won the Man Asian Literary Prize in 2012 and the 2013 Walter Scott Prize for Historical Fiction and was shortlisted for the Booker Prize 2012 and the 2014 International Impact Dublin Literary Award. Tan divides his time between Kuala Lumpur and Cape Town. The House of Doors is his third novel. So he's gone three for three with the Booker Prize, which is pretty impressive, regardless of what you think of the book. Now we get to The Bee Sting by Paul Murray. And this, being honest, is one of the things... I haven't read this book, to be fair. I, I should be upfront about that immediately. I have not read this book. I don't want to be unfair. But this is one of the books that most makes me a little bit, bit like, you know, you didn't put Demon Copperhead on the long list, but this made it. I'm a little bitter about it, that's all. I am not entirely surprised because I included this book on a, a video of things about, like, do I want to read this upcoming release? And the answer was no, I actually don't. But I felt like a lot of people would want to know or be excited that Paul Murray has a new book coming out because there are a lot of people who are a fan of Skippy Dies, which was his previous book. So I'm going to stop hating. Let's talk about what this book is about. I'll link my do I want to want do I want to read these books video down below. Uh, a patch of ice on the road, a casual favor to a charming stranger, a bee caught beneath a bridal veil. Can a single moment of bad luck change the direction of a life? Dickie's once lucrative car business is going under, but rather than face the music, he's spending his days in the woods building an apocalypse-proof bunker. His exasperated wife, Imelda, is selling off her jewelry on eBay while half-heartedly dodging the attentions of fast-talking cattle farmer Big Mike. Meanwhile, teenage daughter Cass, 
formerly top of her class, seems determined to binge drink her way to her final exams. And 12-year-old PJ, in debt to local sociopath Ears Moran, is putting the final touches to his grand plan to run away. Yes, in Paul Murray's brilliant tragicomic saga, the Barnes family is definitely in trouble. So where did it all go wrong? And if the story has already been written, is there still time to find a happy ending? Let's do a quick thing about Paul Murray. It doesn't sound like a bad book. I think mostly I just thought Skippy Dies was really long and trying very hard to be quirky. So I think that's why I would probably be very hesitant to read another one of his books. But I could be convinced to change my mind if feedback on this book is overwhelmingly positive now that the long list has been announced. I'm not even sure this book is out yet. But here we go. Paul Murray was born in Dublin in 1975 and wrote his first novel, An Evening of Long Goodbyes, while doing a creative writing MA at the University of East Anglia. The Bee Sting is Murray's fourth novel. His previous three, An Evening of Long Goodbyes, Skippy Dies, and The Mark and the Void, have all met with critical acclaim. An Evening of Long Goodbyes was shortlisted for the Whitbread First Novel Award and nominated for the Kerry Group Irish Fiction Award. Skippy Dies was shortlisted for the Costa Novel Award and the National Book Critics Circle Award and longlisted for the Booker Prize. The Mark and the Void won the Everyman Wodehouse Prize 2016, Paul Murray Lives in Dublin. Now, I'm really excited to get to the next one because this is one of the books that I have not heard of and don't know anything about. So this will be the first I am hearing about Western Lane by Chetna Maru. Chetna Maru's tender and moving debut novel about grief, sisterhood, a teenage girl's struggle to transcend herself, and squash. The sentence ends there. It just says, and squash. <laughs> but let's get into the rest of the blurb on the Booker website. 11-year-old Gopi has been playing squash since... Oh, I guess it just means squash like the sport. Okay. Just felt like the sentence should have continued beyond that. Anyway, 11-year-old Gopi has been playing squash since she was old enough to hold a racket. When her mother dies, her father enlists her in a quietly brutal training regimen, and the game becomes her world. Slowly, she grows apart from her sisters. Her life is reduced to the sport, guided by its rhythms. The serve the volley, the drive, the shot, and its echo. But on the court, she is not alone. She is with her pro. She is with Ged, a 13-year-old boy with his own formidable talent. She is with the players who have come before her. She is in awe. I am not a squash player. I'm not a huge sports book person. This does definitely sound like it has that element of the personal and you know family in there, but it does not immediately grab my attention. It will be very interesting to see what feedback on this is now that the long list has been announced. It will be very interesting to hear what people have to say about this, because a lot of people read the entire long list. I am not one of those people. I like to use it as a tool of discovery, but I don't read the whole long list. So I'm definitely not going to say anything either way on this book. It, I, I will say it does not immediately grab my attention, but I am not going to try to write it off right away. I am just going to say that I'm, I'm going to wait for feedback from other people to see what they have to say about it and how they like it as they begin to read the long list. Here's some information about Chetna Maru. She was born in Kenya and lives in London. Her stories have appeared in anthologies and have been published in the Paris Review, The Stinging Fly, and The Dublin Review. She was the recipient of the 2022 Plimpton Prize for Fiction, awarded annually since 1993 by the Paris Review to celebrate an outstanding piece of fiction by an emerging writer published in the magazine during the preceding year. Before becoming a full-time writer, she worked as an accountant. Western Lane, which is longlisted for the Booker Prize 2023, is her first novel. That takes us to another book that a lot of people predicted would make it to the longlist, In Ascension by Martin McInnes. This is a book that, uh, although a lot of people have predicted it, I don't actually know a whole lot about it, so this will be interesting to read. Exploring the natural world with wonder and reverence, this compassionate, deeply inquisitive epic reaches outward to confront the great questions of existence while looking inward to illuminate the human heart. 
Lee grew up in Rotterdam, drawn to the waterfront as an escape from her unhappy home life. Enchanted by the undersea world of her childhood, she excels in marine biology, traveling the globe to study ancient organisms. When a trench is discovered in the Atlantic Ocean, Lee joins the exploration team, hoping to find evidence of Earth's first life forms. What she instead finds calls into question everything we know about our own beginnings and leaves her facing an impossible choice to remain with her family or to embark on a journey across the breadth of the cosmos. It sounds interesting. Does not immediately grab my attention again. So this is another book that I'm going to have to wait for feedback as people read the Booker long list. And I'm going to wait and see what they say before I really commit either way to this book. Let's find out about Martin McInnes. Martin McInnes is a Scottish author who has written three novels to date. These include Infinite Ground, which won the Somerset Maugham Award. McInnes was born in Inverness in 1983. In Ascension, long listed for the Booker Prize 2023, is his... It's weird that the Booker Prize keeps... The, the reason I'm looking at this page is because it was on the long list, but they keep announcing, oh, this book was long listed. But yeah, we know. I'm bitter about Demon Copperhead. Can you tell? Uh, is his third novel and follows infinite ground and gathering evidence. His writing has already earned him a Somerset Mom Award, the Scottish Book Trust New Writers Award, and a Manchester Fiction Prize in 2020. He was selected by the Guardian slash British Council as one of 10 writers shaping the UK's future. He currently lives in Edinburgh. That takes us to another one of the books I don't know anything about, Prophet Song by Paul Lynch. So here is what we have. A mother faces a terrible choice in Paul Lynch's exhilarating, propulsive, and confrontational portrait of a society on the brink. On a dark, wet evening in Dublin, scientist and mother of four, Eilish Stack, answers her front door to find the GNSB on her doorstep. Two officers from Ireland's newly formed secret police want to speak with her husband. Things are falling apart. Ireland is in the grip of a government that is taking a turn toward tyranny, and as the blood-dimmed tide is loosed, Eilish finds herself caught within the nightmare, nightmare logic of a collapsing society, assailed by unpredictable forces beyond her control, and forced to do whatever it takes to keep her family together. It sounds like a, something a lot of people are probably feeling in the world right now, given... The, uh, the stress I'm certainly feeling as an American about the impending election, and I think a lot of other Americans are feeling, uh, the fact that Italy elected a fascist <laughs> prime minister and uh, a lot of the things going on in the UK right now. So definitely feels topical. I feel like that might be a little too stressful for me right now, but it does sound interesting. And I would be curious. I think because I'm a little worried that it would stress me out right now, I would probably hold off and see what people say about this book as they read the long list, but it does sound interesting. Here's the information about Paul Lynch. Paul Lynch is an internationally acclaimed Irish novelist who has published five novels, winning several awards in the process. Before Prophet Song, which is long listed, I'm just going to remove all of the long listed for the Booker Prize 2023 in the future, because it says that it for everyone. Uh, before Prophet Songs, Paul Lynch wrote four novels, Beyond the Sea, Grace the Black Snow, and Red Sky in Morning. His third novel, Grace, won the 2018 Kerry Group Irish Novel of the Year and the 2020 Ireland Francophonie Ambassadors Literary Award. His second novel, The Black Snow, won France's Bookseller Prize for Best Foreign Novel. Now we get to another book I don't know anything about, All the Little Bird Hearts by Victoria Lloyd Barlow. Victoria Lloyd Barlow's lyrical and poignant debut novel offers a deft exploration of motherhood, vulnerability, and the complexity of human relationships. Sunday Forrester does things more carefully than most people. On quiet days, she must eat only white foods. I'm guessing this is the one with the neurodiverse protagonist. Her etiquette handbook guides her through confusing social situations, and to escape, she turns to her treasury of Sicilian folklore. The one thing very much out of her control is daily. Do Dolly, sorry, Dolly. I should be wearing my glasses. <laughs> her clever, headstrong daughter now on the cusp of leaving home. Into this carefully ordered world step Vita and Rolo, a charming couple who move in next door and proceed to deliciously break just about every rule in Sunday's book. 
Soon, they are in and out of each other's homes, and Sunday feels loved and accepted as never before. But beneath Vita and Rolo's po polish lives something else, something darker. For Sunday is precisely what Vita has always wanted for herself, a daughter of her own. Ooh, that's an interesting little turn at the end. Uh, it sounds interesting. So far, that's the one that I would... If you told me of the ones that I ha don't really know anything about, you have to pick one. This is the one that I would pick so far, but I uh, want to hold until I read the rest of the list uh, before I commit to that. Uh, here's some information about Victoria Lloyd Barlow. She has a PhD in creative writing from the University of Kent and has extensive personal, professional, and academic experience relating to autism. Like her protagonist Sunday in her debut novel, All the Little Bird Hearts, Victoria Lloyd Barlow is autistic. She has presented her doctoral research internationally, most recently speaking at Harvard University on autism and literary narrative. Victoria lives with her husband and children at the coast of Northeast Kent, England. And there you go. That takes us to another one that I don't know anything about, Pearl by Sean Hughes. Sean Hughes contemplates both the power and the fragility of the human mind in her haunting debut novel, which was inspired by the medieval poem of the same name. Marianne is eight years old when her mother goes missing, left behind with her baby brother and grieving father in a ramshackle house on the end edge of a small village. She clings to the fragmented memories of her mother's love, the smell of fresh herbs, the games they played, and the songs and stories of her childhood. As time passes, Marianne struggles to adjust, fixated on her mother's disappearance and the secrets she's sure her father is keeping from her. Discovering a, a medieval poem called Pearl and trusting in its promise of consolation, Marianne sets out to make a visual illustration of it, a task that she returns to over and over but somehow never manages to complete. Tormented by an unmarked gravestone in an abandoned chapel and the tidal pull of the river, her childhood home begins to crumble as the past leads her down a path of self-destruction. But can art heal Marianne, and will her own future as a mother help her find peace? Interesting that motherhood seems to be a theme among these books. Okay, so of the books that I have not really heard much about at this point, this is the one that is standing out the most so far. I think there might be a couple more, but that sounds really interesting. Here's information about Sean Hughes. A writer who grew up in a small village in Cheshire, England, where her debut novel, Pearl, is set. Returning to live there after her mother's death, she borrowed from the medieval poem Pearl to write a story set in an old house she cycled past every day as a child. I love that. I find that fascinating. Her first collection of poetry, The Missing, was longlisted for the Guardian First Book Award, shortlisted for the Felix Dennis and Edinburgh Prizes, and won the Seamus Heaney Award. Pearl, her first novel, is longlisted for the Booker Prize 2023. They got me on that one. I didn't manage to skip over it before I saw what was happening. All right, now we get to this other Eden by Paul Harding, which I actually started over the weekend. I'm not, I think I'm about 50 pages in so far, really liking this book a lot. Full of lyricism and power, Paul Harding's spellbinding novel celebrates the hopes, dreams, and resilience of those deemed not to fit in a world brutally intolerant of difference. Inspired by historical events, this other Eden tells the story of Apple Island, an enclave off the coast of the United States where castaways, in flight from society and its judgment, have landed and built a home. In 1792, formerly enslaved Benjamin Honey arrives on the island with his Irish wife, Patience, to make a life together there. More than a century later, the Honey's descendants remain, alongside an eccentric, diverse band of neighbors. Then comes the intrusion of civilization, officials determined to cleanse the island. A missionary school teacher selects one light-skinned boy to save. The rest will succumb to the authorities' institutions or cast themselves on the waters in a new Noah's Ark. Again, I started this over the weekend, and it is fantastic. I know at least one Booker Prize predictor uh, noticed a clue that this would make it onto the long list, which is that Essie Adujan provided a blurb for it on the cover of the book. So, And since she is the chair... Obviously, you could tell she was a fan of this book. I think even without that, a lot of people were really seeing momentum and word of mouth building for this book. It had a sort of quiet release, but it's definitely been building a lot of word of mouth. And I, I started it this weekend, and it's living up to that. It is really fantastic and well-written so far. 
Paul Harding attended the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where he studied English and has taught writing at Harvard University and the University of Iowa. This Other Eden, long list, they almost got me, is Harding's third novel. His debut novel, Tinkers, was published in 2009 and won the 2010 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction and the 2010 Penn Robert W. Bingham Prize, among other honors. He published his second novel, Enon, in 2013. He has an MFA from the Iowa Writers' Workshop and is currently director of the MFA in Creative Writing and Literature at Stony Brook University. He lives on Long Island, New York with his family, which I didn't know until I saw that in the thing about him on the back flap of the book. And that did kind of endear him to me. It's not that it's uncommon to live on Long Island. It's not, I'm sure it's not where he's originally from, but I am originally from Long Island. My father went to Stony Brook University so it, not for English, but uh, it's a fun connection. I've actually, I have met Paul Harding. He was doing a signing at Book Expo when Enon was released in 2013. So I actually have a signed copy of it on my shelf somewhere around here. <laughs> um, and what's funny is because he is so low key, I don't remember him. I just remember getting it signed, which is just a fun thing. And uh, I'm I'm glad to see, I've heard so many good things about Tinkers and uh, I'm looking forward to reading it as part of my Pulitzer Prize project. So it's fun to see him getting more recognition again. Let's get to the next one, which is How to Build a Boat. Another one that I am unfamiliar with. It's by Elaine Feeney. With tenderness and verve, Elaine Feeney tells the story of how one boy on a unique mission transforms the lives of his teachers and brings together a community. Jamie O'Neill loves the color red. He also loves tall trees, patterns, rain that comes with wind, and the curvature of many objects. Books with dust jackets, cats, rivers, and Edgar Allan Poe. At the age of 13, there are two things he especially wants to in life, to build a perpetual motion machine and to connect with his mother, Noel, who died when he was born. In his mind, these things are intimately linked. And in his new school, where all else is disorienting and overwhelming, he finds two people who might just be able to help him. That does sound really fascinating. And like, it could be sort of sweet, sort of sad. It does definitely catch my attention. I don't know that I would replace Pearl as the unknown book on this list that I would most like to read, but it's it's close. There is potential for it to be a little, I don't know, a little quirky. I used to love quirky books. Now, as I'm getting older, I am sort of moving away from them. So I do feel like I would want to know a little bit more about the tone of the book. But here's something about Elaine Feeney. She's an award-winning poet, novelist, short story writer, and playwright from the West of Ireland. How to Build a Boat is Feeney's second novel. Her 2020 debut, As You Were, was shortlisted for the Rathbones Folio Prize and the Irish Novel of the Year Award and won the Katie O'Brien Award, the McKitterick, McKitterick Prize, and the Dalkey Festival Emerging Writer Award. Feeney has published three collections of poetry, including The Radio Was Gospel and Rise. And her short story, Sojourn, was included in The Art of the Glimpse, 100 Irish Short Stories. Feeney lectures at the National University of Ireland in Galway. Now, I don't want to hate. I liked If I Survive You by Jonathan Escoffrey. It's the only book on this long list that I have read in full. I'm working on this other Eden, but it's the, this is the only book on the long list that I have read in full. I liked it, but in the Friday Reads where I talked about it, I complained about it a lot. I'll link that video down below. And in the time since then, the book has mostly disappeared, and I, the problems that I had with it sort of persisted to the point where instead of saying, this is a book I really liked, but I had some problems with, it's become just, it's fine, and that's it. To choose this book instead of Demon Copperhead, it's a choice. And again, I don't want to hate on a book that, like, it's nice that If I Survive You is getting recognition. It's nice that Jonathan Escoffrey is getting recognition. I'm just bitter that Demon Copperhead was completely omitted from the long list. And I think Demon Copperhead is a way better book than If I Survive You. I'm bitter. I'm bitter. And I'm sorry. I apologize to Jonathan Escoffrey. He's not watching this. <laughs> but you know what I mean. An exhilarating novel in stories that pulses with style, heart, and barbed humor while unraveling what it means to carve out an existence between cultures, homes, and paychecks. In 1979, as political violence consumes their native Kingston, Tapper and Sonia flee to Miami. But they soon learn that the welcome in America will be far from warm. 
Chulani, their youngest son, comes of age in a society that regards him with suspicion and confusion. Their eldest son, Delano's longing for a better future for his own children is equaled only by his recklessness in trying to secure it. As both brothers navigate the obstacles littered in their path, an unreliable father, racism, a financial crisis, and Hurricane Andrew, they find themselves pitted against one another. Will their rivalry be the thing that finally tears their family apart? I said it's it's a good book. I would be very curious to see what Jonathan Scoffrey does next because I think it shows a lot of promise. But I think there are a lot of ways that you can tell it's a debut novel, and I don't necessarily mean that as a criticism. But again, I'm just I'm kind of bitter that Demon Copperhead was left off the list. I mean that is a very assured, confident, and really well done book, and this one has some flaws. That's all. His debut, If I Survive You, announces Jonathan Escoffrey as a skilled chronicle of a chronicler of American life at its most gruesome and hopeful. He is the recipient of the 2020 Plimpton Prize for Fiction, a 2020 Endowment for the Arts Literature Fellowship, and the 2020 ASME Award for Fiction. His fiction has appeared in the Paris Review, American Short Fiction, and Electric Literature, and has been anthologized in the Best American magazine writing. He received his MFA from the University of Minnesota, is a PhD fellow in the University of Southern California's PhD in Creative Writing and Literature program, and in 2021 was awarded a Wallace Stegner Fellowship in the Creative Writing program at Stanford University. And there you go. We have how many books left? Three books left. And the next one is Study for Obedience by Sarah Bernstein, another book I really didn't know anything about when this was announced. In her accomplished and unsettling second novel, Sarah Bernstein explores themes of prejudice, abuse, and guilt through the eyes of a singularly unreliable narrator. A woman moves from the place of her birth to a remote northern country to be housekeeper to her brother, whose wife has just left him. Soon after she arrives, a series of unfortunate events occur. Collective bovine hysteria, the death of a ewe and her nearly born lamb, a local dog's phantom pregnancy, a potato blight, she notices that the community's suspicion about incomers in general seems to be directed particularly in her case. She feels their hostility growing, pressing at the edges of her brother's property. Inside the house, although she tends to her brother and his home with the utmost care and attention, he too begins to fall ill. It sounds really interesting. I could definitely be convinced to read that. I feel like I'm still going to wait and see what the feedback on this is from other people. But it does really grab my attention. Sarah Bernstein is a Canadian writer and scholar who was born in Montreal and now lives in the Scottish Highlands where she teaches literature and creative writing. In 2015, she published Now Comes the Lightning, an acclaimed collection of prose poems. Study for Obedience is Bernstein's second novel. Her debut, The Coming Bad Days, was published in 2021. Her fiction, poetry, and essays have appeared in publications such as Contemporary Women's Writing, Math Magazine, Granta, and Room Magazine. In 2023, she was named by Granta as one of the best young writers in Britain. It does sound like a really potentially interesting book, and I, I am intrigued. I think I would still say Pearl is the one of the unknown to me books that I would still grab most readily, but uh, that that might be up there. Now we get to Sebastian Barry and Old God's Time. Sebastian Barry is one of the big names on this list. Technically, you have to say Paul Harding is since he has won a Pulitzer, but I think Sebastian Barry is arguably the biggest name on this list. He's been at least long listed for the Booker Prize, I think five times? I think five times. And he's a very, I don't want to say a very well-known writer, because I don't think he's on the level of like Barbara Kingsolver, Zadie Smith, Salma Rushdie, not to repeat those three names, but he's definitely, I would say, the most known writer on this list. In his, this, by the way, was included in BBC Culture's Best Books of 2023 so far. I will include a link to that video down below. And um, it sounds really good. I'm actually going to start with a different book of his that I purchased. It's in my most recent book haul. But I, I'm, I already know a little bit about this, and it sounds really interesting to me. In his beautiful haunting novel, in which nothing is quite what it seems, Sebastian Barry explores what we live through, what we live with, and what may survive of us. Recently retired policeman Tom Kettle is settling into the quiet of his new home, a lean-to annexed to a Victorian castle overlooking the Irish Sea. For months, he has barely seen a soul, catching only glimpses of his eccentric landlord and a nervous young mother who has moved in next door. 
Occasionally, fond memories of the past return, of his family, his beloved wife June, and their two children. But when two former colleagues turn up at his door with questions about a decades-old case, one which Tom never quite comes to, came to terms with, he finds himself pulled into the darkest currents of his past. It sounds really interesting, and I've heard some really good things about it. So it is on my list, but I want to read that other one first. Sebastian Barry's novels have twice won the Costa Book of the Year Award, the Independent Booksellers Award, and the Walter Scott Prize. Barry had two consecutive novels shortlisted for the Booker Prize, A Long, Long Way, and the top ten bestseller, The Secret Scripture, before Old God's Time was longlisted for the Booker Prize in 2023. He has also won the Kerry Group Irish Fiction Prize, the Irish Book Awards Novel of the Year, and the James Talt Black, Mer Black Memorial Prize. Barry was born in Dublin in 1955 and now lives in County Wicklow. The book that I have is uh, Days Without End by him. Uh, I, I don't think I mentioned that. I just referred to another book. And as I was talking, I was like, I should just say the name of the book. <laughs> That takes us to A Spell of Good Things, the final book on this long list. It's by Ayabami Adebayo, a dazzling story of modern Nigeria and two families caught in the riptides of wealth, power, romantic obsession, and political corruption. Ayabami Adebayo's breathtaking novel shines a light on the haves and have-nots of Nigeria and the shared humanity that lives in between. Eniola is tall for his age, a boy who looks like a man. His father has lost his job, so Eniola spends his days running errands, collecting newspapers and begging, dreaming of a big future. We're, and I, I'm probably going to mispronounce this name, but I'm going to say Waraola is a golden girl, the perfect child of a wealthy family, and now an exhausted young doctor in her first year of practice. But when sudden violence shatters a family party, Waraola and Eniola's lives become inextricably intertwined. I've heard good things about this book, and... Um, Ayabami Adebayo wrote another book. I want to say it's called Stay With Me. I've heard really good things about that as well. So uh, this is one that I would be interested in reading. Award-winning author Ayabami Adebayo was born in Nigeria and now splits her time between Norwich and Lagos. A Spell of Good Things is Adebayo's second novel. Her debut, Stay With Me, won the Nine Mobile Prize for Literature, was shortlisted for the Bailey's Prize for Women's Fiction, the Welcome Book Prize, and the Kwani Manuscript Project. It has been translated into 20 languages, and the French translation was awarded the Prix L'Afrique, longlisted for the International Dylan Thomas Prize, and the International Dublin Literary Award. Stay With Me was a New York Times, Guardian, Chicago Tribune, and NPR Best Book of the year. I don't really want to do a full prediction for what's going to win the Booker Prize, but it definitely feels like This Other Eden by Paul Harding and Old God's Time by Sebastian Barry are the heavy hitters here. Part of that is because they are the ones with the biggest stature, but uh, it feels like Sebastian Barry, since he's been here before, he can't be counted out. He's the sort of long-standing author who, if you want to give a book prize based on a career, could fit in. But there's a lot of enthusiasm for the book as well. So that could definitely happen. This Other Eden is steadily becoming one of the most talked about books of 2023. I really think it's going places. So I think that definitely makes it a huge contender for the win. And all of these lesser known books on here are sort of unknowns. I wouldn't be surprised to see a lot of them build momentum. I mean, last year was so exciting because it felt like you had uh, Treacle Walker um, or Treacle Man, whatever the Garner book was last year. And uh, that was definitely the Sebastian Barry last year, like the person who's had a long standing career, very well respected. Although in that case, the book was very iffy and it doesn't seem to be the case with Old God's Time. Maybe that makes Sebastian Barry a bigger contender this year. But anyway, point being, last year was so exciting because people weren't really familiar with this, um, Molly Almeida and as the long list was announced, as the short list was announced, and people read it, people got very excited about it. And then it ended up winning. So I feel like the makeup of this long list feels like that could happen again. That people will discover something that was a smaller title and it will end up building enough momentum to carry it across the finish line. But I'm going to say this other Eden would be my knee-jerk prediction right now if I had to make one. And I don't. I'm doing this to myself. But I'm going to say that, and then we'll see what happens as things develop. That's not going to be my permanent prediction. But right now, based on what we have, this other Eden is probably what's going to win. I really think it's building momentum and solid word of mouth as the year goes on. So that'll be interesting to see. So we've already covered snubs. So that covers everything with the Booker Prize long list for 2023. 
does seem like a good book mix of books and authors. I am excited about it. I, I will say, I mean, again, I don't want to hate on Jonathan Scoffrey, but I think Demon Copperhead is a massively superior book to that. And that's not a knock on Jonathan. Well, it is kind of a knock on Jonathan Scoffrey, but I think he is a very promising new talent. And Barbara Kingsolver is someone who has a lot of experience and really leveraged all of that to fantastic effect. But leaving my bitterness aside, this is a pretty good long list. Uh, it has some, a, lot, a lot of really exciting books. There's nothing in here that immediately makes me think, oh, no, I do not want to read that. And that's really good. When you have 13 books together, you're bound to find one that's like, oh, that is not for me. And that didn't happen, at least not to me. So I would love to hear what you think of this long list, what you would like to see make the short list, which will be announced on September 21st, what you think you're sad to see didn't make it, and all of that stuff in the comment section down below. As always, I really appreciate your time, and I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.